We have an amazing panel here today, and uh, what, I've, what I've heard so far in the last couple of hours is that people really want to hear real-life examples from what's happening on the street. So we're going to try to ask the folks up on the panel here to talk from their own experience and from what they've seen uh, from that and from other places that they've been, and to make it as much as we can a, a conversation and leave enough time for uh, people to ask questions. So I want to briefly introduce the panel. Their bios are in the book. Um, but uh, to my left, going down, Kyle Kimball is the new president of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, quasi-public uh, organization here in New York, um, who manages a lot of the large scale, or is a big partner in a lot of the large scale redevelopment uh, in New York. Um, to his left is Jonathan Rose, the legendary uh, head and of Jonathan Rose Companies, who works for, uh, from a private sector perspective on doing redevelopment uh, around the country, often with a real green perspective and manages a number of impact investment uh, funds. To his left is Judith Bell, the president of PolicyLink, which is a nonprofit organization that works all over the country with uh, various partnerships to try to uh, see that what happens in cities is as inclusive as it needs to be uh, for the long-term health of the country. And then to her left, is Jody McLean. Jody is the President and Chief Investment Officer of Edens, and Edens is a large owner and developer of retail real estate across the country. So we're really hoping that we're going to have a great conversation about redevelopment that, from pr with perspectives that come from the public, private, um, nonprofit sectors. So I want to start off and just say, so the title of this is, Can Redevelopment Be Good for Everyone? And when I looked at that, the first question I asked was, who's everyone? And what does good mean? So maybe I could just start off, Kyle, you mind if I kick that off with you from, from your city perspective? Sure. It's, uh, I haven't had enough coffee for large existential questions. <laughs> uh, and we only have 50 minutes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so the, I guess I'll tackle the... Uh, so we, we manage a lot of redevelopment projects for the city. Uh, the Economic Development Corporation works for the Office of the Mayor, um, and we do a lot of big, large area, area-wide redevelopment projects. We also run a number of projects through our Center for Economic Transformation, which uh, are meant to be economically transformative. And through that process, I'm answering the question around what is everyone. So uh, in terms of EDC for the city plays a, a number of different roles. We are a construction builder. We, are th we have a think tank. We are a foundation. Um, we advise. We advise the city. We have one client as our as our advisor. And that's the office of the mayor. And through through that process, our version of everyone uh, is uh, the best projects that we have seen to tackle this question mm -hmm. of everyone are ones where it's a community driven process where uh, voices are heard. They are factored into the realities of uh, real estate development. Uh, we try to match and accomplish as many things as we can. And then at the end of the day, we are judged by the outcome and the economic development that happens. So in the case for us, the fact that New York City um, over the last uh, few years has recovered 300% of the jobs it lost during the recession. So not only are we back to where we were, we're actually two times better than we were in, in 2008. Uh, the fact that we have record high private sector employment uh, and that we actually have seen um, some wage growth uh, within that within that growth. Mm -hmm. uh, to us, uh, I hope at the end of the day that is everyone, everyone who wants a chance uh, to, to be a part of this uh, uh, developing an economy. And Jonathan, from a private sector ex uh, perspective, when you go in to do a project or an initiative, how do you think about it as being good for everyone? And what's your role in that? So I'm going to expand the question a little bit. So I'm not first, that surprised. So really. first of all, uh, we are working with a definition of what is good. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go to that. Good, so please. we primarily work in lower income communities um, or mixed income communities or, or communities in, in hopefully in transition. And um, there's a wonderful phrase that's been emerging in the last few years called a developing communities of opportunity. Mm -hmm. So communities of opportunity are places in which the residents have access to jobs, education, <coughs> mass transit, health care, parks, and open space. So they're places in which the community itself is a platform for improving their lives through providing this range of services and opportunities and providing the connectivity within them. 
So then my definition of good is that it is strengthening the, the opportunity quality of a community of opportunity. And um, that everyone is that it's, the project is increasing the connectivity. So I don't believe you can ever solve everything for everyone. Sure. But that it is enhancing or increasing the connectivity, both opportunity for individuals and their connectivity to the larger system. Because that has system. So in a way, I'm looking for the health of the specific population you're trying to serve, but simultaneously improving the health of the system that is part of. And in that, we think of both the social human economic system, but also the natural system. Mm -hmm. So a project that creates more employment but degrades the capacity of nature to enhance the life, we think is not, is a negative, is not good. And so Jody, let me ask you also from the private sector perspective, your company doesn't have quite the stated uh, public purpose that I think Jonathan's does, and maybe yours is more of a, 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 a what we see more commonly across the country. How do you view this um, when you do when you look for either new locations or look to work in a place? Um, Eden's has a very simple purpose, which is to enrich communities, and that's it. And so we start every project sort of from the same place where we say we have one opportunity to affect these buildings in this place. And after that, it will influence generations to come and communities to come. So we look at it really based on who's today's stakeholders, how are we additive to today, um, and how are we creating places, and we're very focused at the street level, we're horizontal developers, um, vertical in the retail space, and typically bring in partners um, for the FAR above. Um, so very focused on how our places um, affect not only how communities interact today in, in what we call the human analog format. I just sat <laughs> through this technology. Um, so we talk a lot about human analog because we really think that that's what builds com um, communities and cities is how human beings and human beings are who are making the decisions to relocate to those cities. So that's where we spend a lot of our time. Um, and we typically look out, I would say, two generations. Mm -hmm. So Judith, let me ask you this. Um, so these are uh, pretty unusual people on the stage. I'm not sure they show up everywhere around the country. Um, what are the challenges that you guys at PolicyLink have seen to good having redevelopment would be good for everyone? I think the primary challenge is around when the attention goes to those who are typically left behind. Because too often it happens at the tail end of the process or when community rises up and says what's about to happen. In our neighborhood, uh, we haven't been consulted. It doesn't meet our vision and it won't meet our needs. And moreover, if you, if you do this in a few years, when you come back, we won't be here. Mm. So central to redevelopment is to think about community and really to make it more in the vision of what community development has thought about historically. It really rests on three questions. And the three questions, I think, are who benefits, who pays, and who decides. Mm -hmm. And if at each of those questions there's an answer that says we are turning to community residents, we're turning to community building institutions, we're making it authentic and intentional, then you can really begin to see redevelopment development, meet the needs of community, and meet the needs of community in a way that allows them to stay in the community, right? Too often, what happens is community residents actually advocate for their community to be more of a community of opportunity. And then the market takes over, the city and uh, and regulatory agencies haven't actually anticipated the good things to come, and so they haven't taken those steps. Now, in places that do, I mean, just to lift up a couple examples. So okay, in, in Seattle, as part of the Sustainable Communities Initiative, which brings together in a region all of the key players, as part of transit development, they're purchasing vacant land. They're looking at commercial stability. They're thinking about, in advance, knowing that the market is going to drive with transit, what can we do to make sure there'll be affordable housing and what can we do to support and maintain neighborhood serving businesses and other folks what what if what do, where would you say you see the best examples of the public private uh, sector kind of coming together to maximize the quote-unquote good to come from redevelopment 
So another example, I don't want to say best, because yeah. there, there, but there are many interesting good examples. And so one is the city of Denver. Mm -hmm. So first of all, infrastructure is the armature upon which this all takes place. So without great transportation infrastructure and water and sewer infrastructure needed in some places, you can't do the rest. And what we've seen in Denver is this incredible um, alli allegiance in which uh, 50 different communities, city and, state count, city and county entities, came together and created one unified mass transit system, a light rail system, that provided the connectivity. That system was conceived of as a transportation system and not as an affordable system. And so uh, they really left out the um, uh, access to affordable housing. So then enterprise community partners and others came together and created an acquisition fund that created the resources for people to buy land and, and locally a land trust was created to buy land next to mass, the new emerging mass transit to preserve it for affordable housing. So you saw this mixture, the infrastructure side and the, pri the public private sector side um, gathering together to create a solution. Uh, I think one oh. example, um, in the, over the last 12 years of the uh, Bloomberg administration, there's been so many different projects, uh, but I think one that stands out for something that was, uh, you know, started really in, in this administration at a grassroots level and has tur turned into a huge benefit for the city, for a neighborhood, uh, and led to a redevelopment process that we actually could not have designed better uh, if we had done it ourselves, and that is the High Line mm -hmm. uh, here in New York City. And for uh, an $80 million investment and a stay of execution, um, on behalf uh, of the mayor's first couple of weeks in office, we have billions of dollars of private investment happening in the west side. Um, we have a whole new renaissance of galleries. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to experience the city, and just similar to what Jonathan said, it, it just it, it took city living to a, just another level that I think a lot of people didn't realize was possible in New York City. Uh, and we're expanding that into the third phase, which is in Hudson Yards, which is a, an also a large development project um, that will also bring a lot of development. I think the question though, was, was Highline good for everyone? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think generally speaking, I don't know anyone for whom it was not good. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, I'm sure that there are people who were dislocated uh, from the neighborhood who are priced out of their rentals. Um, I think the question is, in terms of a development project, it's our responsibility as um, stewards of the public in the limited amount of time we are here to make sure that the externalities that people face of our development projects are limited, that there are things that we are doing to compensate for that um, to, you know, to the extent that a business needs to be relocated, how, are, how is the government doing that and softening um, the blows that might come from the redevelopment projects. But ultimately, I think governments are judged uh, for the long-term dividends that the development projects we are doing give to the city. I think the real issue of humanity is a question of how you treat the people who are uh, who, who who face the extra the negative externalities yeah. of the projects. Yeah, I, and I want to get to that in a minute. Yeah. Well, I just want to Judith. on this issue. I want to point to actually the city of Cleveland, uh, which actually has taken community benefit agreements to another level. So those began quite a long time ago, and they started with communities, in particular one uh, example in LA, where they advocated for an actual agreement with the developer to provide things for the community, affordable housing, parking, it's LA, uh, <laughs> parks, jobs, et cetera. And now the city of Cleveland has said, go forward a couple decades and think about how you take it not to be project by project. And the city of Cleveland has said, look, we're going to make a partnership here. We're going to bring in agencies. We're going to bring in the unions. We're going to make a commitment that says in our projects, we're going to train workers, diverse workers, who will then be hired. We're going to set targets. And the, the I think the idea here, which is so important, is that it is looking to not just the places, but the people. And it's thinking about the jobs in the projects, right, as well as the jobs that will be created. In San Francisco, the Public Utilities Commission is investing $60 billion in a sewer project. That's true around the country, St. Louis. You could keep listing cities. They're actually thinking about the community benefit associated with that construction. They are requiring every contractor who comes in, who bids on a project, to explain what the community benefit is and to think about jobs and concrete benefits that are going to be provided to the community. So you have to build 
build it in from the front end, and you have to build it in both from the public side and then push the private side to deliver as well, because all of these big projects are a mix of the public and the private, and there are incentives, and there are, uh, you know, there's carrots and sticks and all of that, and you really have to, you, you can't just wait until afterwards. You've got to do the analysis beforehand. You've got to set up the indices to monitor it, and then you have to have a way of enforcement as well. Thanks, Jonathan. So two points. The first is, is anybody here from Cleveland? So, <laughs> so Cleveland is the most collaborative city that I know in which everything is done by networks. It's incredible. So for example, all the local not-for-profits form together to create the Cleveland Housing Network, which really does re real estate development for all of them. Uh, the university uh, circled area in which all the not-for-profits, universities, institutions came together. They just had this this practice of which of of just collaboration and networking, um, uh, in a, this kind of modest Midwest. Let's all non-egotistical way. It's an amazing model. <laughs> no, it's really important. And so they're the ones who gave birth to the Evergreen Co-ops. That's mm -hmm. kind of would only come out of Cleveland in some ways. Uh, it's being so, replicated. I know, but I said come out <laughs> okay. of. So so anyway, it's just worth. That's the only conflict we've had so far. It, <laughs> No, we agree. We just <laughs> so it's just worth looking at. But the second thing I wanted to go back to the High Line mo and go further back, and that is to Battery Park City. Now, when Battery Park City was developed, it was new land, so there were no, there was not a community really to conflict right. with, <clears throat> and there was a big debate as to whether it should have affordable housing or not. Mm -hmm. And the decision was made that it should not have affordable housing, but that, that all the proceeds would fund affordable housing throughout the cities. And much of the success of what we see in the South Bronx and bed -Stuy and the whole rest of the city was funded with that Battery Park City money. So it's an amazing model. It's a dangerous model. Because very often people can say, well, we won't do affordable housing here, but think of how much we can do elsewhere, right. and then it doesn't happen. Right. So when you create a high line that creates so much uh, possibility of value, is anybody here from Chicago? So Chicago has the Bloomingdale Trail, which is the next going to be the next great high line in America happening. I, th I mean, I'm sure there are others too. But um, uh, So one of the things to think about is, is it worth creating a whole lot of value you can spread around to the places which are very unlikely to be on the value chain? And I think there's something to say to that. But you have to have the discipline to make sure that really happens. Yeah, let me go, Jody, let me go back to you and, and come back to places that you've seen have created the environment that you believe is A, a place you want to work, but it also has a greater chance of getting redevelopment be good for everyone. I, I don't know if I fully understand Just your places, question, yeah, just but, examples um, where, where you, you see progress. The examples that we've seen, and then I want to go back to the Highline too, because um, I would have brought up the Highline as a great example, but I think it's also one of the greatest challenges we face as a private investor with institutional money and this conflict of time and conflict of looking at um, large investments that really pay off with value further down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and the High Line, I think, is a great example that a lot of us go to routinely to say, um, yes, it was public-private, but um, there's a payoff that's come much quicker than originally anticipated. So it is one that we go back to routinely. Um, one of the great examples, I think, um, of just because it affects us personally, is what DC has done with some of its metro stops and taking a chance and putting in some public-private um, um, funding to get the metro. Um, I think the Noma Gallaudet Metro is a great example. It sits on the red line. It's coming into Northeast DC, so it's going to do two things. It's going to allow Northeast DC, which in its past history has been very blighted for different reasons, um, to have development that it would not otherwise have in a very sustainable way. So instead of being dictated by um, the Department of Transportation, it really can be dictated by sustainable transportation. Um, and I think there are great institutions in that area of D.C. that have otherwise been overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, they're allowing to be very additive to this process as well. So instead of um, taking an area that would be redeveloped and relocating a lot of people, it's bringing in a lot of development and adding to that which is already there and celebrating great institutions that I think otherwise would go unnoticed in universities, um, both Howard, both Gallaudet, 
in some of the churches and some of the schools that are sitting there that are able now to really um, do much better than otherwise. Great. I, I want to actually challenge something that Jonathan said about Battery Park City. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's this notion that you can take these dollars and put them somewhere else. Because we know from history, right, that neighborhoods of concentrated poverty are not communities of opportunity. So you have to have the ability of people to be in diverse mixed income communities in order for, we talked all about this earlier, about the social capital and the social connection. So it has to be both about mobility, right, and it has to be about having having the opportunity. So uh, I want to push against the idea that you could just contribute to a fund and have it go somewhere else, and the need to actually have affordable housing in those places that are being redeveloped. Uh, and I think too often otherwise you end up with just neighborhoods where you're going to concentrate poverty and where there isn't the opportunity, you've got to hope then for linkages with transportation. You've got to have both. You've got to have the ability to make investments in low-income communities and you've got to have the ability to have affordable housing and opportunity in those communities that are being redeveloped that may be more higher income. And I know that's true from your practice, but I just wanted to push it into so, the example. So let me try example. to make, broaden that a little bit and talk about what you all think the role of government is and what are the um, incentives that, <laughs> the incentives that um, government should give to, to encourage this or the policies that they should put in place to require or mandate this. But what, what's your take on the role of, of government uh, to maximize the opportunities from redevelopment? <laughs> I guess I'm the government guy. Jonathan said, yeah. you're the government, you go first. Uh, it's a complicated question. Yeah. Um, in this particular administration, uh, our role, we have seen our role to spend, uh, if, if we have to spend money, first is to try not to spend money, mm -hmm. the city's money. Uh, and, and, and when I say spend money, meaning uh, trying to uh, do projects that have to have a subsidy. Uh, we do a, a number of different types of projects, so area-wide redevelopment projects. We also work on business attraction uh, and retention. So it sort of depends on what we're talking sure. about. In the case of a redevelopment project, uh, first and foremost, we try to spend zero to little as little money of taxpayer resources. Because at the end of the day, the money that we are giving is the money we're using to pay for right. basic services, uh, firemen, teachers, that kind of thing. So that's the first and foremost. To the extent that we have to spend money, it is... Uh, to the, or have to provide a subsidy to mm -hmm. something, it is to uh, spend as little as possible to induce a behavior that otherwise may not happen. So in that case, uh, it might be uh, a certain co uh, convention center or a certain con component of a development project that we particularly would like to see from a development perspective, but it just doesn't make sense right. from, the, uh, from the private market, so we have to put something in. Uh, and typically then we will put in uh, provisions that we get it paid back right. uh, to the extent that the, we are right and they're wrong, that, it's, that it will be successful uh, and, and uh, more, more successful than they think. And that's actually been quite successful. Um, I think also going to the issue around Battery Park City, because um, I don't want to let Jonathan off the hook on that one, um, <laughs> is I think it's important to, um, I think Jonathan's example was a good one in that Oftentimes we see in development projects, and you know, people here, if you're interested in this topic, you're generally a progressive person, and I'm a very progressive person myself, and you want to see the outcome right now. Mm -hmm. You want to see um, the, the issues, and you want to happen because you want to be a part of it. Something like uh, Battery Park City requires a very long-term focus, right. and the people who put that in place uh, did not necessarily need to get credit for the affordable housing right. today, knowing that it will come decades later. And so I, th I personally think that our role in this administration has been to induce behavior that otherwise may not happen, but also to uh, many of the projects we are doing, you will, you know, Applied Sciences, Seward right. Park, Coney Island, Willits Point, uh, Hudson Yards, Seven Train Extension, uh, East mid East mid East Midtown moder uh, now you're modernization. Off, now I'm you're just saying off. it's just all of these projects are things that will that you will not see. Uh, city bike. Jeanette yeah. Sotokan is here, for example, expanding a transportation network. Ferries. These are things you will not see the true dividends on for right. a very very long time, if not generations. And I think ultimately that's the responsibility of the government is to just lay the groundwork and induce behavior that may not happen. All right. I'm told that I have to open up for Q and A. So if you can answer their questions with his, you know, answering mine or theirs, whatever you like. Um, any questions? 
here and then there. My name is Sharon Robinson, and I'm from the city of Milwaukee. And I, I just had a question that's related to job training. Um, and I just wanted to say that in Milwaukee, we have a lot of poverty concentrated in certain neighborhoods in the city, in particular African-American neighborhoods, so high unemployment rates. Yet we have a number of large-scale economic development projects that are about to come down the pike, including the rebuild of Northwestern Mutual. And it's like a $450 million project that should generate 1,000 jobs. So I'm wondering if you guys have any insights on really creative job training programs where you could connect those residents in the poorest neighborhoods to jobs, job training that might help prepare them to get the job. Okay, thank you. Well, I'd say look to your community colleges. I mean, around the country, the most powerful, I think, partnerships come between cities and community co colleges and the private sector. And then it's about creating those programs that are going to be actually reflective of what the regional economy looks like. So as you look around the country at those partnerships, if you look in Silicon Valley, the partnership there with the community college is focused around that region and the training that's needed there. We know that that's where the economy is heading, is that those, the, the degree, the AA degree is going to be the basic for most workers, 45% of workers coming up. So I would say look to community colleges and build from there, and I can give you a bunch of different examples of places that have done those. One thing we've done in the city um, is, you know, we, we, we get a lot of credit for, um, or a lot of coverage of our applied sciences initiative in the Cornell and NYU and Columbia campuses. The other thing you, we were doing, and my answer to your question is, you have to have a redevelopment agency that understands that it's not just about the development project itself, but about the economy that we're either creating mm -hmm. or the economy that we are changing from. Right. And so in the case of applied sciences, it wasn't just us going out and attracting a campus and saying, here's $100 million and half of an island, go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that was part of it. Uh, the second part of it was we have a whole suite of initiatives that are focused on uh, what, what we call LINK, leveraging innovation in our neighborhoods or knowledge economy. So the idea there is we know that we are trying to create a new type of new set of jobs and we have eight different programs that focus on people who are um, underemployed, immigrants, uh, folks who have dropped out, um, uh, trying to get them trained for the economy that we're trying to create. And these are pilot programs that we're going in. So I think the answer to your question is there's a lot of innovation going on. It's really about self-awareness of what your projects are and who is affected and making sure that the programs are tailored to those populations. Can I just add one more thing briefly? Sure, please. So it also depends on where you are in the recovery. So for example, two or three years ago, what we were hearing from contractors are, I used to have 45 plumbers, I have 15. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My number one goal is to bring my old guys back right. before I hire any of your new guys. Today, we in New York, we're in a space where it's full boom construction employment, basically, and there's tremendous opportunity to bring new people into the workforce. So you've got to kind of be, understand where you are in your own cycle. Right there. Sir. Thanks. Uh, Doug Sussman of Sussman Urban Design in Los Angeles. Um, fascinating discussion. But I have to say, pretty US centric, if not New York centric. So, my question to you is Is redevelopment by its nature uh, a national discussion or a municipal discussion based on our own economic and government restrictions? Or do you have examples where your successes are exportable to other, other cities globally, or where you have imported uh, redevelopment procedures from other countries that, in an innovative way, could work in this country? Great question. Anybody? We happen to have met in Sao Paulo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, yeah, so Jonathan and I uh, uh, traveled to Sao Paulo together. Uh, how did I get to do all the talking? You guys? Um, and, you know, we I have been asked a lot of questions because the Economic Development Corporation here in the city is a unique uh, mm -hmm. organization relative, and it's a function of a strong mayor system and a strong mayor in a strong mayor system. Right. Uh, having said that, we have been asked by Sao Paulo, uh, and a number of London, um, Minas Gerais in Brazil. Uh, we've done a lot of different um, collaborations um, in terms of the public process, in terms of, uh, they're, certainly they're mostly focused on, more focused on housing uh, as the number one uh, issue. But yes, we have spent a lot of time with different cities, um, mostly having helping them think about how to create redevelopment agencies that are quasi-governmental um, that have the ability to push these things forward and separate them out a little bit from 
what is otherwise potentially a, a very political process. So what's happening globally, you're seeing, is old historic city, more modern city around that, urban sprawl at the edges of huge amount of poverty, aspiration, disconnection from transit and from, from really good infrastructure. I mean, that's not the universal pattern. But in which it, it cries simultaneously for redevelopment of the downtown, which kind of gets, got ignored as the new kind of downtowns got created. And also an enormous need to incorporate the urbanizing edge back in, which is developed, but needs to be redeveloped and reconnected back into the city. So this conversation is totally relevant. I think the other way it's relevant is that internationally you see poor people being pushed out uh, and ending up on the outskirts, and we're seeing that now in our cities. And so the need to figure out those solutions is a global need. Question way in the corner there. Hi, I just had a question maybe bringing politics. Sorry, I'm Daniel from Civworld. I just had a question. This is bringing in politics perhaps, but the last election in New York or the, I suppose, the one going on. Um, just reflections on that and um, its implications for the continuance of development of the kind that you've been pursuing or um, things to that nature. Thank you. Any New Yorker want to react to that? <laughs> The good news for, so we are in the affordable and mixed income green building uh, housing business, and the good news is that both candidates seem to acknowledge the need for affordable housing as a basis for having a thriving workforce economy. Ted. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so a uh, quick one. Ted Smith, uh, run Economic Growth and Innovation in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, can you help uh, sort of give some advice on what to do when you have neighborhoods, you know, let's say deeply in poverty, they're in historic sort of industrial corridors, brownfield sites, city steps in to control the sites, but then the most obvious users are not um, acceptable by the neighborhood, right? And so then you're stuck. Give an example. What kind well, of so, so you'll get industrial, modern industrial users who may be willing to take the leap on the site. They don't create necessarily as many jobs as we as a city would like to see in the location. And they may be unwilling to hire from the immediate area as a policy matter. And so, I mean, I have dozens of sites like this, right? And I know all throughout the Midwest, there are thousands of sites like this. And so the, the real tension then is, so you don't want to leave anybody behind. When you reach out to everybody say, what do you want here? We get, you know, quite frankly, an unrealistic list of things that they would right. like to have. Um, and then we have ready opportunities. And they create some number of jobs, right? All jobs are good, right? So um, I just sort of love some help as we as a city navigate, you know, the realities of redevelopment and some of the toughest case scenarios, you know, where you're really, you really have to make decisions about, um, you know, do you go, do you continue blight? For another decade, maybe waiting for the perfect situation, or do you sort of contribute to more structural, long-term potentially blight by doubling down on today's industry? There you go, tough one. Can I just ask a follow-up question, yeah. which is, um, why aren't they willing? If local people were trained, and why won't they? Why don't they want to hire any local people? That's the part I don't understand. Well, a lot of the obvious users. Are, are essentially expanding their enterprises. They have their own, you know, existing employees, or they may be bringing employees from other locations. And so it's it's not as if uh, they're starting from scratch. So maybe you need a community benefits agreement. I mean, maybe you need to say to those folks if they're coming there that they need to be in partnership with the neighborhood to bring jobs and opportunity because otherwise the neighborhood's gonna block their entry. I mean, I give you a small example in a different environment, but uh, in which a grocer's coming to a neighbor that hasn't had a grocery in decades, and he uses dollars for workforce investment in order to train neighborhood residents. The neighborhood actually embraces the store. It is more successful than his suburban stores. He actually hires and trains folks who are re-entering from the criminal justice system, and he finds that he has better retention from those workers because they so value the job. So, I mean, I think there are many ways to innovate, but I think you have to start with the notion that people in the neighborhood should see some benefit. Otherwise, you really can't expect that they will oppose you at every turn. In particular, if it's industrial and it's going to be not clean 
industrial. There are going to be all sorts of other issues that are going to surface. Any question? Hi, my name is Aisha Glover. I'm from the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. Um, and I just wanted to hear maybe some examples of uh, urban industrial uh, development that's working well across the country. We've been, um, I guess, on a really strong run in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And I'm just wondering what, uh, what other projects are similar around the country. Or challenges around industrial development, sure. or um, yeah. I'm sure a lot of cities are faced with similar building stocks, aging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you repurpose that to create more jobs as kind of a model for economic development? If you didn't work for the Brooklyn Navy Yard, I would put the Brooklyn Navy Yard as a very good example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and across the city, there's uh, there's uh, Brooklyn Army Terminal, which you're familiar with in uh, probably in in the Sunset Park. Uh, region and uh, the cooperative markets in the Bronx uh, around food, fish, and produce. Um, I think we, we would consider those successful. There are infrastructure issues associated with those developments, but they are something that are vitally important to the city and ones in which we have essentially formed a public-private partnership, the private being the cooperative markets. Um, so the, the catch is uh, the government has, in these aging and uh, industrial buildings, uh, someone has to step in and um, wire these buildings, has to remove all the asbestos, has to put in HVAC. Uh, and just the other day, I toured a building in Sunset Park, which is now known as the Federal Building, was known as the Federal Building. And you know, this developer has spent $74 million of his own money on a $3 million, $3 million square foot building without a tenant. And so it takes tremendous risk uh, for someone to step in and do that. And, and vision. And so in this industrial area, this is really an area where I think government still has a vital role in stepping in and solving uh, a problem that the private market probably won't on its own. I want to add two things to that. You earlier mentioned the issue of capital, length of capital, and when we deal with most uh, institutional investors, that's seven to ten years, and they're not going to probably put up 74 million for a project like that. And that's where government can really come in with most effective tool we see are TIF bonds. Uh, but um, the second thing is the, the, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is in Brooklyn. And what Brooklyn really had has had this resurgence of over the last 20 years is the maker community. And I think we have to rethink what industrial development is from the old big corporations. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, and I hope you get them where you want them. But on the other hand, uh, we also need, there's a, a, an emerging bubbling up industrial economy that we need to support too, that's much more fine-grained. Hey, say Benji. Oh. Could I ask you to give your impressions about the use of land and the reuse of land from Detroit? I mean, Benji Kennedy is from the Kresge Foundation and has been working intensely on the redevelopment of, of parts of Detroit, which is basically half of Detroit, I'm being a little extreme, but half of Detroit, 68 square miles or so, is really not lived in and the other half is it's lived in and probably more viable and sure uh, this so this is this is a cold call it is <laughs> presumes i've been paying attention yeah I, I have been it's a it's a it's a it's a good question it's a it's a it's a challenge right so i think the two things you got to think about one is you got to think about utilization rate of of industrial space um and and i think our challenge uh in detroit because we have so much uh, dormant industrial space is to is to actually do precisely what what Jonathan just suggested, and and find uses that that probably aren't necessarily as productive right. as the uses that we'd like to see. Um, it may not generate the same type of sort of revenue from a tax revenue standpoint, etc., for the city, but they are still land and space intensive, right. um, and and I think that is a you know that so aiming at the sort of land space uh, intensive uses um, that that may not have the highest kind of productive value is important. So that's like a, that's like a mindset switch um, that's required. Uh, and then I think uh, in terms of sort of the relationship uh, to community, um, you know, I, I look, it's, it, again, uh, the ideal would be uh, that you can upskill people um, in a way that they can fill jobs that are created. Um, and, and frankly, there are not a lot of jobs created, you know, as I just suggested, by some of these kind of fine grain activities. Um, but in the absence of kind of job creation out of these out of out of repurposing 
from industrial facilities. I think you look for other ways that, that, that the tenant or the, the occupant can deliver um, value to the, to the surrounding community. And I, I would argue there's actually many, many ways that range from the sort of streetscape improvement, even if you're not using TIFs, et cetera, streetscape improvements and um, you know, delivering certain services to the community that they might not other, otherwise have, public safety and these sorts of things um, can be initiated by, by occupants. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think they can also do things that are more episodic. I mean, there are ways in which a tenant, an occupant, um, a, a maker community actually can go out and engage a community, not on an ongoing basis, but once a month, once a year. I mean, in a, you know, uh, these things are not um, insignificant in, in terms of building that bridge between a, a community that doesn't necessarily, a surrounding community that, that doesn't necessarily have the skills to participate in the economic activity in a given site, um, and, and, the, uh, and the occupant, the tenant, the economic agent in that site. So I mean, that just, that's a little bit of how, how we're thinking about kind of solving this puzzle in Detroit. Fabulous. I think we might have time for one more question. Right in the middle. Thank you. My name is Rainer Kern. I'm representing the city of Mannheim in Germany, actually the only European city who is invited to the conference. So would you allow me to bring in the European as aspect of the discussion? Sure. In Germany, now you can find and see a movement, a re renaissance of a movement, going back to a French sociologist and philosopher, Henri Lefebvre. He wrote a book in 68, which was entitled The Right to the City. Of course, it was entitled Le Droit à la Ville, because he wrote in French, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he wasn't forced to write this book after, after the war, because every, all, all the cities were redevelop, redeveloped. And now this movement became very strong in, in Germany, very strong, for example, in Hamburg, where the, the whole Harper city was redeveloped, as you know. And I'm asking whether you have movements like that in the US and how you faced these movements. Maybe quite similar movements or different. There are actually, uh, it's a group that has embraced right to the city uh, nationally and talks, points to the European experience and talks about the need to figure out uh, from an American perspective, what that looks like. And it gets to the very dynamics we're talking about around development and people being fearful or living in places like Los Angeles and San Francisco and New York where the redevelopment has pushed pe poor people out. And so thinking about what is the right to the city over the long haul and how do you create a city that can be mixed income and where you can have communities of opportunity, as Jonathan was saying. And so they look to a combination of private and public action uh, to allow for uh, people to remain over the long haul even as cities change and redevelop. We have time for more? We have one more? Right in the front row. Hi, I'm Kelly Bernard from Los Angeles. And to Aisha's uh, question about um, other opportunities around um, using or utilizing um, our industrial space. And so Los Angeles um, embarked, uh, our last mayor and this mayor continues to do this, on um, taking our kind of industrial uses and repurposing them, not most of the space is kind of warehousing. Um, there was an example, we partnered with um, our utility company to kind of build a clean tech campus. And so it was um, stepping in where the private sector wasn't ready to go in because it was an old, um, unreinforced masonry building, we needed HVAC, we needed asbestos removal, lead abatement, all of that, um, and trying to prime the pump exact in for this innovation. And so it will eventually house um, clean tech companies um, who we identified and they're working in a temporary space but getting it ready for them and um, it was a struggle. I mean it was a, you know, many people said just tear it down and let it, you know, let and, and sell it to the private and let them do something. Um, with it, but the um, city, along with our utility, fortunately, we had a. a I was given the one minute, so you got to ask your question so you can get an so answer. So again, the point is, um, it does take um, the role of government. It, it does take, um, in many of these older kind of cities, um, government to come in and kind of prime that pump. And so it was less a question, oh, more okay, of great. an example of uh, where other cities are doing it. Thank you very much. Could just, you get I've the been, last word. I've just been thinking about our colleague here, who's actually asked for help, mm -hmm. and I've just been thinking about actually answering that question. And I think, um, you know, not knowing the city or the, the circumstances or anything like that, I would say the principles that, that I think I've found successful are, one, self-awareness. So in, in terms of the city itself, uh, knowing what it's good at and what it's not. Two, 
uh, and, and playing to the strengths and pushing the boundaries of the strengths seems obvious. I think two is protecting the balance sheet. So having a line where you are, uh, you will negotiate to a point and then having a true walk away that you just can't give away the store because uh, you might make a good deal one time, but it's going to be a precedent for the next three companies who want to come, and you've given away your tax revenues for the next 30 years. So I'd say protecting the balance sheet. I would say third, um, if you're not dealing from a position of strength such that you feel like you can have a community benefits agreement, um, I would say that there are, if, if the, there are potentially creative ways to get the company to come, and if they won't hire the local workers, maybe there's some investment they will make in either the education system or the streetscape improvements mm -hmm. or something to the city. Because uh, if they're truly there for the long haul, at the end of the day, they're going to be interested right. in getting the community and the residents to the right. point where they will hire them or, and have a long-term relationship. So I, I think the third is being creative. Great. So I want to thank the panel for being a part of this session. <laughs>